Colossians chapter 1. If you'll turn there. If you're visiting with us, we go through the books of the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We just started the book of Colossians. We've gone as far as verse 9 of chapter 1. And Colossians, of course, is one of the prison epistles that have been written to us. There's four of them in the New Testament. There is the book of Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians written about the same time. And then he would write the book of Philippians in about 62 AD before his release. As Paul is writing to this church of Colossae, on his third missionary journey, he would make his base of operation. You read about it in Acts chapter 19, there in the city of Ephesus. We know from chapter 20 that Paul would be there for three years and and he would, as the city was given over to the gospel, great revival would break out. That he would teach those disciples, those young men, uh, in the school of Tyrannus for two years. And it is, according to church history, that there was an individual named Epaphras. He would get saved. He would be discipled by Paul the Apostle. Then he would return to the city of Colossae, which was located about 100 miles east of Ephesus. And the church there would be planted and grow about five years after that time that Paul was in the city of Ephesus. Well, Paul ended up in Rome in his first imprisonment. Epaphras would make that journey from Colossae over to Rome to, to see Paul. And he would give him a report about how the Christians in Colossae were doing. And as we open up this letter last time, he, he writes to them, of course, inspired by the Spirit of God. And he compliments this church. He expresses how he was praying always for them, how he was thankful to God for them. And the reason that he was is because I've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. And I've heard of your love for all the saints. And what a wonderful thing for the Apostle Paul to say about a church. I hope and pray that as people hear about us here at Calvary Chapel, that they would say that, oh, the saints there, we've heard of their faith in Jesus Christ. We've heard of their love for all the saints. That it wouldn't just be about hype or anything like that. They're in cutting edge, all this. No. They have faith in the Lord. They have a love for all the saints. He would say that you have the hope of heaven. You're keeping a heavenly perspective. And fruit is being produced in your lives and in the church. And you're doing well. And Paul would refer to them as faithful brethren as he would refer to Epaphras as a faithful minister and a servant of Jesus Christ. And so Paul, in his opening statements and greetings to this church, which he had never visited, but had heard of all the things that were praiseworthy, that this is a church that God was working in. But always remember this, that just as it was in the first century, as it is in this century, that whenever God is working in your life or in your family or in a church, that Satan's going to come against that work. And he was doing that in the first century. And the way that he was doing that is... There was a problem. A papyrus would bring some concerns and problems that were taking place in the church of Colossae and happening to the other churches there, particularly in Asia Minor. And the main problem was a false doctrine that had crept into the church, a teaching or a doctrine that would develop in what was called Gnosticism. And, and it was taught among the Christians. And what the Gnostics taught is they claimed to have special or unique knowledge. They were boasting in the knowledge that they claimed to have, which was very deceptive. It was untrue. It was a teaching that denied the supremacy of Jesus Christ, the deity of Jesus Christ, the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. They would deny the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ because they believed all matter, all material things are evil. And because our bodies are made of flesh and bone and blood, that that's all evil. And Jesus could not have had a physical body, just look like he did. So they denied the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you were with us a couple weeks ago, as we opened up the book of Colossae, that I said to you that Paul's going to speak about getting them in sound doctrine here. And, and we'll see that as we continue to travel through, particularly the first two chapters of the book of Colossians. But right doctrine leads to right living. If you just embrace false doctrine, weird doctrine, it, you're not going to have right living. And what was happening with the Gnostics and those who were bringing it into the church, it would lead to two 
camps of uh, how people would respond to it. There are those who embraced Gnosticism that said, uh, hey, my body's evil. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it, so I might as well just live any way that I want. Eat, drink, and be merry, and just enjoy life. The other side, the other camp was, well, uh, because our bodies are evil, they would turn inwardly. They would isolate themselves. And we see in chapter 2, Paul talks about those who say, don't touch, don't, don't taste, don't do anything. And, and they would deny themselves. So there were those things that were taking place as the Gnostics were gaining ground in, in popularity within the church. And Paul addresses these issues, bringing truth and correction once again, so that they could be established in truth. He will once again confirm and give them and us, because this letter is written to us as well, a clear understanding of the preeminence of Jesus Christ. And he will continue to do that as he writes this short uh, epistle to them as we travel through these four chapters. And now as Paul prayed for the Christians in Colossae, as we pick up our text at verse 9, we're going to see what Paul prayed for them specifically. And I think you know this to be true, that whenever we see a prayer from the men and women of faith in the scriptures, we want to pay extra attention to that prayer because it really is an example to us. It really shows us, you know, what we should be praying for and, and what we should be praying uh, for uh, concerning others, what is important, an eternal perspective. And Paul certainly brings that as he is praying for the saints here. So let's begin to look at that. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, we do read, And for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And verse 11, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Uh, one wonderful prayer uh, of Paul for the saints here that were in the city of Colossae. Verse 9, Paul writes, We have since day one heard of your affairs, how things are going in Colossae, that we have not ceased to pray for you. And a quick reminder, something that you know, that it's important and it should be a priority for us that we are praying for one another. That you're not only praying for your own family, for your kids, for, but for the brethren as well. And we are to do it fervently. We're to do it constantly and continually. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, tells us to pray without ceasing. And I will say this, I need your prayers. Uh, the, the leadership needs your prayers. Uh, there's so many prayer needs as you get on the prayer chain that come through every single day of people that are going through difficulties and loss and going through challenges in their lives and needs. So it's important that we pray for one another. And we know that as Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, pray without ceasing. And as I mentioned, even going through the book of Philippians, another one of Paul's prison epistles, he said that my chains are for the furtherance of the gospel. I know you're worried about me, that I'm in the prison cell, but it's God's will. It's for the furtherance of the gospel. How was it for the furtherance of the gospel? Well, he was witnessing at the end of the book of Philippians. He says, those of Caesar's household, those of the palace guard, uh, give their greetings to you. They were getting saved. He would write these epistles, the four epistles of Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon that we have in the canon of Scripture that's preserved for all eternity. And he also prayed for others. He redeemed the time, as we were told in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, redeemed the time for the days are evil. Now, what can happen to any of us is we can complain about the times. And I understand that because we look around us and there's a lot to complain about. But don't forget, we are to redeem the time. The days are evil. We can redeem the time by continuing to be a light to others, to pray for others, to give the gospel to others. And Paul didn't spend his time in that prison cell just complaining about his situation. We would understand if he did because he had been through a difficult season of uh, going from jail to jail for about uh, two years there in Israel, and then he's taken over to Rome where he's chained to a Roman guard 24-7. But he says, I'm going to pray without ceasing. 
not only for the Christians of Colossae, but we know that he would make it a priority to pray for the Christians that were in the other churches as well. And Paul in that prison cell, listen, did not think I can't do anything here. God's got me here for the furtherance of the gospel. And maybe you're in a circumstance or a situation you feel like you're chained to it or you're imprisoned by it, that I really can't do anything, so I might as well murmur and complain or do nothing. Listen, don't focus on what you can't do. Maybe there's, you're thinking, I want to do this ministry, or I'm not able to because moms and dads, you're raising your children in the ways of the Lord. Or maybe, dads, you're just working so hard to provide for your family. Maybe you're taking care of elderly parents. Maybe you're just in a season where you're just not able to do some of the things that you want to do, but you are to do all things as unto the Lord, okay? And don't focus on what you can't do. Focus on what you can do. Focus on what you can do, and all of us can continue to grow in the Word of God. All of us can continue to be a light to others, and all of us can pray. So he prayed for them without ceasing. Now he writes what it is that he prayed for them in verses 9 and 11 that we read. Let's read it again in verse 9. That you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now as a pastor, the number one question I think that I get is how do I know God's will for my life? There are many books that are written in Christian circles on how to know or the secret of knowing God's will. And Paul here writes, I pray that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. That word fill means to completely fill, filling to completeness and knowledge, uh, full discernment and full understanding. So Paul's prayer is that you would have a full, deep understanding of his will, not my will, but Lord, your will. What is your will for me in my life? And that is a prayer of a mature Christian. Lord, what is your will for me concerning every area of my life, every decision I make in life, and the direction I am going to go in my life? And the very first thing that all of us need to do in finding God's will is, first of all, be fully submitted to God. Be trusting in him and what he declares to you. And to understand his word given to you, And as we submit to him in his word, then we can have spiritual understanding and wisdom. And as you and I read his word, as we get established in the word of God, and that's one of the reasons that we study the word of God here chapter by chapter at Calvary Chapel. We place a high priority of it because then we are filled with the knowledge and the understanding of his will for us. There are many verses that tell us how to live, many verses that guide us and direct us in every area of our lives. A few verses, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. It's amazing how many Christians, and I don't say this condemningly, but I really say this brokenheartedly, feel like it's okay to be involved in immorality. It's okay if I live with my boyfriend, my girlfriend. Everybody else is doing it. No big deal. Culture says it's okay. It's not God's will for your life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. And you see, Paul would tell us in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, in Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And if you want true wisdom and knowledge of his will, you go to him. You look to his word, not to the world. Not to the word or philosophy of the world. And Paul will go on to say in chapter 2 that if you do that, you're going to be cheated. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, Pastor Jeff, I need to make decisions. My family needs to make decisions about specific things. Do I take this job? Do I start this business? Do I move to this city? Do I buy this home? Whatever it might be. And I get asked that a lot. How do I know what God's will for me is in this situation? And again, my answer is this, that you go to him. Paul would write in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your heart. There is a corporate application for that as he says that you're to put on the bond of love and 
May the, the peace be evident in the body of Christ, a peace that rules in your heart. But there's an individual application as well. That word rule means to make the call. It literally means a baseball umpire. Let the Lord make the call. I know that oftentimes in my life, when I'm making a decision, it's like, Lord, do I go this direction? Do I do this thing? If I don't have a peace about it, I'll, I'll just stand and, and be still and not move forward until the Lord does give me a peace. And if he doesn't, he, he's telling me something. But I also know that Isaiah chapter 30 tells us, a good chapter for you to read, that the Lord brokenheartedly, that he would say to the children of Israel, that you seek counsel, but not of me. You're going to Egypt, which is a picture of the world. Pharaoh's wisdom's not going to help you. The fast Arabian horses aren't going to give you victory over the enemy. But you are to come to me. And as you go to him, for counsel, for him to work in your life. In returning to him and rest in him, you shall be saved. And quietness and confidence will be your strength. So we are to go to him. We are to wait on him. And he promises that as we wait on him, he'll be gracious to us. And then we will hear from him, Isaiah chapter 30, that you'll hear a word behind you saying, this is the way you walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand, whenever you turn to the left hand, you got decisions to make today? Go to him. Ask him. If you lack wisdom, he'll give it to you liberally. And you ask in faith. Knowing that God wants to guide you and direct you. In the Old Testament, the people would go to the priest and they had their arm and the thumb them, And that's a study for another time. They're not even really sure what that was. But the priest would pull out a stone and give them an answer or something like that. We have something so much better, the Holy Spirit of God. So I want to give you again, once again, a reminder, especially in the day that we're in of summertime and long days, that you got decisions to make. You've heard from him. You've heard from her. You've heard from them. You've heard from Pastor Jeff. Take your Bible. Take a pad. Take a pen. And go to him. Have your devotions. And a lot of times the Lord will speak to me through the scriptures. Lord, I need to make a decision on this. And I want to be in your will. And he will speak to your heart. And know this, when he does speak to you, and that peace that rules in your heart, that word that he speaks to you will never, never contradict what the written word of God has declared to you. God loves you. And he wants what is best for you. And he desires to guide and to direct you. So that's the first thing that Paul's prayer for us. It's a good thing for us to, to pray that, Lord, help me to just be in the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding and to pray for others, to pray that for our kids and our family members and those that we love. And then we read in verse 10 that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So you're filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Then you will be walking in a way which is pleasing to him. Now, now Paul is not saying that you have to earn favor with God or you, you have to earn being worthy uh, for the Lord. Listen, what he's telling us is now that you are a believer, walk worthy of the Lord. You should know that as a Christian that there is nothing that you can do in and of yourself to be worthy of the Lord apart from faith. Because apart, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith in Jesus Christ. Paul's already commended them in their faith in Christ Jesus, what he has done for us, making us a child of God. Now we're a son and daughter of the living God where we have the spirit of adoption that we can cry out, Abba, Father. And I believe what Paul is saying here is now that you've come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you walk worthy of the Lord. You and I are now children of God. We belong to him. Then walk in a way that pleases him. It's very similar to what he would write in Philippians, uh, that, that uh, church that he wrote to from this prison cell that he's in, that he said, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, since we are Christians, we sh should show it in how we live. That we would desire to know the will of God and have it worked out in our lives. That we are to be ones that even as Paul would go on to write in, 
in the book of Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He did not say work for your salvation because we can't work for our salvation. He said work out your salvation. Now that you are a Christian, have that, that faith that you have in Christ that have the Lord work those things out in your life that are pleasing to him and he desires to do that. You see, the, the other side of the spectrum is sometimes people just base, you know, their Christian walk on performance. Listen, just love him and walk with him. Live in a way that is pleasing to him, yes. But the other side of the spectrum, there are those who say, well, I'm a Christian and it doesn't, you know, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And it's an excuse just to continue in sin. It's kind of like, well, everybody else is doing it, no big deal. Uh, boys will be boys. You know, so one area of my life that I'm, I'm kind of messing up in, no. We should grieve over sin. We are to repent of sin. And we don't want to ever have the attitude. I, somebody was saying not just uh, too long ago, well, David, David committed murder and adultery. Well, he did. And David would experience serious and very difficult consequences and repercussions because of it. And it was Nathan that came to David and said that you have caused the enemies of God to blaspheme his name. And that broke David's heart because he was a man after God's own heart. And David would not be the same king after that. He was a better psalmist. And you see in those psalms after he sinned with Bathsheba, the brokenness of David. And writing those psalms, and I have sinned against the Lord and only you, Lord. And David would experience serious consequences in his family because of that. Don't ever get to the point of thinking, well, you know, David sinned. The people in the Bible sinned. I sinned. It's no big deal. No, you should grieve over it. Don't think, how close can I sail the boat to the rocks before I crash it? How close can I get to the world and still be a Christian? It should be, Lord, I want to please you with my life. Now that I am a Christian, this great salvation that I have that Jesus died for me and loves me, I want to live for you, walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that's pleasing to you. That's what's being told to us. Lord, I want to walk with you and be an example and be in your will concerning my conduct, my speech, my faith, my love, my purity, how I am to live. Does this please you, Lord? Is it worthy of the calling as a child of God? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So walking worthy of the Lord means walking and loving the Lord in a way that pleases him, honors the Lord with your life. And then as we do that, being fully pleasing uh, him. And then secondly, being fruitful in every good work that we read here. We are to be fruitful people, not fruitcakes, but fruitful people. Producing fruit and know that it is God that produces that fruits in our lives. It will be, happen as you're filled with the knowledge of his will, as you live as a life pleasing to him. As Jesus said in John chapter 15, that abide in me and, and, and as you abide in me and abide in my word and in my love, you're going to produce fruit. And Jesus would declare that I am the vine and he who abides in, in, in me and bears forth fruit. And without me, you can do nothing. So fruit being produced in our lives by the working of the Holy Spirit in every good work that we do because we're surrendered to the Lord. So we walk worthy of the Lord by fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and then thirdly, in increasing in knowledge of God. Not just increasing in the knowledge about God, but the knowledge of God. And what that does is it brings us into a closer, intimate relationship with him. You who have been here long enough, you know that being established in theology and sound doctrine is very, very important. We want to be able to give a defense. We want to know God's word. That's the way to grow and mature. That's the way to grow in your faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But it is not being a Bible student and studying the word of God as we do here and place a high priority so we can become Bible encyclopedias. It's so that we would walk with him and know him. Know his will for our lives. You grow in knowing him that you can't help but respond out of love for him. And you'll have a desire to walk worthy of him and 
the Holy Spirit in our lives enabling us to do that. I was reading Deuteronomy, some of Deuteronomy last week, and I was noticing it's the law, it's the law, it's the law, Deuteronomy. That's what Deuteronomy means, the second law. It was the second time it was presented to the children of Israel at the end of their wilderness wandering. But also as you read Deuteronomy, there's a lot about loving the Lord. Love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So know his will, know his word, how he wants you to walk with him, but know him personally. Be surrendered to him. It's a personal relationship with him. So increasing in the knowledge of God is more than just knowing about him, but knowing him personally and opening up your Bibles and you see the awesomeness and of God, the heart of God, the compassion of God, the goodness and faithfulness of God. And you just can't help but fall more in love with him. And you want to commune with him. Paul was an intellect. But as we talked about quite extensively in the book of Philippians, that he says, I pressed forward. I gave up all the religiousness for the knowledge of him, to know him. And he cries out, oh, that I may know him. And we know at the end of his life that he would write, for this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. It was very personal with Paul. I think that after he became a Christian, that it was for the very first time that he really loved God. All the religiousness didn't do that. And then Paul finishes this prayer for the saints in Colossae, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. God's strength and might and glorious power are working in our lives. Sometimes I can think, Lord, pour out your power on me so I can evangelize and do missionary endeavors to work miracles. And he wants to do that. I'm all for it. I want to be used of the Lord and however he wants to. And however he uses me, I need his power. But notice here, as, as we look at this closely, that Paul writes, I pray for you always that you will be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for what? All patience and long suffering with joy. Lord, help me to be patient in the circumstance I'm in, in the situation I'm in with people. Help me be long suffering in the circumstances and to do it with joy. I need God's power in that. I'm not a patient person by nature. I don't like enduring in circumstances that are difficult. Suffering's hard enough. But long suffering, put those two words together, and, and it's hard and it's difficult. I have a tendency to complain or to murmur. I have a tendency to try to figure it out on my own. And I go through those times where I'm losing patience or it's just a difficult season I'm in, I don't go through that time with joy, but with God's power and might, I can as I seek his will and know him and desire to please him, abiding in him, knowing that he wants to work that joy in my life. And then as we see Paul write about what it was that he prayed for the believers in Colossae, in the midst of that prayer, he gives thanks. In verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Verses 12 through 14 mark this. He gives us some really good reasons on why we as Christians can be thankful every single day, because he has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Paul mentioned in verse 5, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 tells us that we're joint heirs with Christ. That is, we have obtained all the riches of the kingdom of God because we are sons and daughters of the living king. We have an inheritance that is so glorious, so wonderful, we can't even comprehend it. And we have an inheritance that will last for all eternity. Listen, there is nothing in this world, nothing. I don't care all the gold and silver, popularity, you know, celebrity status, whatever it is, that can take the place of that. Do not pursue that, the riches of this world, in place of the riches of the kingdom. And that can happen very easily. The riches of the kingdom of God, store up your treasure in heaven, will last for all eternity, and it is so glorious that we are joint heirs with Christ. That, that amazes me. What really amazes me, too, is when you read the book of Ephesians, 
And I didn't teach this in the other services, but you guys get this because I was just thinking about this in between services. As he tells us of our spiritual blessings that we have in Christ in Ephesians chapter 1. And then he says this, that he's praying for the saints. And that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling that is heaven. And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That amazes me. That you may know of his inheritance in the saints. In other words, you and I are his inheritance. I look in the mirror and I think, Lord, you got the short end of the stick. I'm your inheritance? But that's how valuable you are to the Lord. And we have his inheritance of all the glory of heaven and, and of eternity that belongs to you and to me. So live for him. Live for eternity. Keep your eyes on eternity. So we can be thankful as, as we look at this because we have the who has qualified us to be partakers in the inheritance and the saints in the light. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Convey has the meaning that we are now citizens of heaven as declared to us in the book of Philippians. He's brought us out of the darkness into the light, into the marvelous light, as Peter would say, and there's no reason to go back to the darkness. Why would you want to do that? And the world's getting darker. But as it's getting darker, we get to be more light, shines brighter. We've been brought into the light because we have the light Jesus Christ in us. And we can be thankful because we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. We have been bought not with silver and gold, corruptible things, but with the precious blood of the lamb. So, Father, thank you. Thank you so much. Just so much for these verses that as we read them, we want to grow in the wisdom and will of, of you, Lord. Walk worthy of the calling which you've given to us. To please you with decisions that we make. Desiring to trust you and grow in our love for you. To remember to be thankful because we have you as our inheritance, the heavenly things, the eternal things, join heirs with Christ. We've been brought out of the darkness. The world lives in darkness. We've been brought to the light, the light of your kingdom. And we've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. Father, I thank you. And I do pray for those right now who need to make decisions that are before them. And all of us will. We do every day. That as we go to you, as we wait on you, as we read your word, as we seek you, that you give a peace that rules in our hearts. Guide us and direct us by your word. Be a voice behind us saying this is the way, walk in it. But help us to go to you. To seek godly counsel. Because you want to guide us. If anyone lacks wisdom, we're to ask. You invite us to ask, and you'll give it to us liberally. But with faith, knowing as a child of God, you want to direct our steps. We may not know six months or a year from now, but each and every day, stepping out in faith. And Lord, I just pray you bless everyone here as we grow in the love of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I also want to pray for anyone who may be here or listening that you've never committed your life to Jesus. That he loves you. That's why he came and died for you. The wages of sin is death. There is no hope apart from Jesus. And he came and he went to a cross and died for your sins. And he was put into a tomb and he rose again. He is the son of God. You cannot earn salvation. You cannot be worthy of it in and of yourself. It is, the Bible says recognizing you are a sinner, repent, turn directions, quit going the direction you're going, and come to Christ and surrender your heart to him. He loves you so much. He wants to give you eternal life, hope, reconciliation with the Father that only comes through him to bring you into the kingdom, the kingdom of God, being a citizen of heaven. 
and he desires for you to have that relationship with the Father. Will you do that? Today is the day of salvation. And you can pray, Jesus, I come and I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner. I confess it. I believe you died on the cross for me. You were buried and you rose again and you proved that you're the son of God. You validated what you did on the cross. So be my personal Lord and Savior. Help me to know you and to walk with you, to be in your will. It is growing my love for you. And I thank you for this new beginning and bringing me into the family of God. And I do pray as we leave this place that we would just be light in this dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. You may stand.